I want to start off by reading about the vision of our church, and then we'll talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are going on. Gabriel and I, um, in pastoring this church together, have seen that Ephesians 4, time and time again, is where we are supposed to get our vision from, and it has also lent us lots of good advice in different situations as far as how we handle things and and how we look at things and how we feel about what we're called to do. Now, all of Ephesians 4 is good, but I'm going to focus on verse 12 and 13. This specifically is our vision as a church. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen? Amen. That's what we are called to do, and that's what we are doing by the grace of God. What I love is that we continue to find depth in here. How do you become mature? How do you become mature? Literally, in your faith, in your walk with God, in your relationship with Him, how do you become mature? Turn to James 1, and then I promise you I'll tell you about what's going on. Love it. Mm. Verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develop persever develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work in you so that you may be mature. mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Some of the things that we are seeing at our church is people who grew up in church, people who knew the Lord at one time, got to a place where they thought this must be all there is and stopped there. And we find them finding a place inside the walls of the church because they see that there was so much more. It had nothing to do with God not having more for them. It had everything to do with that point in their life they came to a place and it was just whatever trials may have arisen, whatever people may have been surrounding them, whatever situations they may have found themselves in, that was it. Now, we also have people who are coming in as new believers. We also have people who are on a fiery ramp skyward towards heaven. We have a gamut of people, but we see that the people who are looking for more find a home in our church. That's what we see. Chicago... The best way to describe it, I think, would be a desert, a desert area. Would you agree, Gabe? Desert area. Minus the Spirit of God. If you look, if you look just on the outside, if you walk in and just take a glance around, kind of get a feeling for it, it's like a desert. But what I love is that we serve a God who makes springs appear in deserts. Amen? Amen? And that's what we're seeing happening. We are taking what we received here. And what we received here was a bold understanding of what God was calling us to. And that was to freely proclaim the good news Amen. and the power of God. And the power of God is his Holy Spirit at work in us. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. That's what we're proclaiming. And so as we face trials, as we face different kinds of complications and situations, what we see is that it's breaking in us all of the flesh. It's breaking in us all of our own sinful desires. It's breaking in us our pride. It's breaking in us everything that hinders God from doing the work that he wants to do through us in Chicago. What I love is that when we come back here and we see you guys, not only is it an encouragement, but it's a testimony for you of the place where you are planted now. What I love is when I look back at us five years ago, I see me and some of you guys sitting here. And some of you are in different situations, and praise God for that. But what I love is that the same God that raised us up then and has called us to do the work that we are doing now is calling many of you in here who will one day be sent out for the glory of God. And His kingdom will continue to flourish. We were talking in the back before service started and uh, sometimes you get this idea like, man, the church just, just sometimes it just seems, seems like it's in a rough spot. 
but you're always very quickly reminded that God knows what he's doing with his church. Yes. And then as soon as you begin to feel alone, what he often does is he'll remind you that you're not alone. You remember Elijah, right, when he was in the cave and he was feeling alone because his life was being threatened by an evil queen, right? But he got the word from the Lord. He said, I'm alone. I'm the only one that's doing this. I'm the only one that's out there. And he knew that there were other prophets because he'd been told by someone else who was helping the prophets that there were other prophets. But why did he say he was the only one? Because he was the only one who was out there doing it boldly. Everybody else was hiding in a cave. So he felt like he was the only one. How many of you have felt like you're the only one sometimes, right? Man, does anybody else feel this way about God? Does anybody else have this passion like I feel like I have for God and for his kingdom? And God will quickly remind you, not only are there other people, there is a mighty network of an army all around the world. And there are pieces moving that you can't even see. And what I love is that he is not subject to the communications of this earth like every other army is because his Holy Spirit speaks to us. There is no language barrier. There is no geographical barrier. There's no age barrier. There's no race barrier. There is no division that blocks what God wants to do when he wants to move his army. Amen. And so we see that he is mobilizing an army there. He is mobilizing an army here. And I love to come back and see all of it for the glory of God. So it's very encouraging for us to be here. We give credit, even though it wouldn't be accepted, to the work that God has done in us, um, to what we received here at LCMF. Um, when we talk to people, uh, we remind them of where we came from. Paul did that with Timothy. Remember those from whom you received that deposit that was placed inside you. And we know We've been through, we, we grew up in church. We went to a program called Master's Commission, great program. But the deposit that we received here was so precious and so solid and so strong that it carries us through even, even to now, through the hard times that we've been through because there is no quit. There is no quit. What I love <laughs> as well is that Perseverance has been what God has been using to make his people mature and complete since the beginning of time. Amen. I look at Israel and the story of them in the promised land. You guys remember that story? You guys remember the story right as they came up to the edge, to the cliff of the promised land and 12 spies were sent out. And two of them came back and said, we can do this, guys. And everybody else said, it's not going to happen. They're enormous. Yes, it is like God said. It's a land flowing with milk and honey and it's a good land and it's, it's everything that God said it was. But there are these hardships that are ahead and we can't do that. We can't do what God has called us to because we're this and they're this, right? How many feel like this sometimes with a this in front of you, right? So they came to the edge of what God had called them to and because of their lack of faith, because of their doubt in what God could do through them, they stepped back and they went, they went back to the desert. Now, did that change what God was calling them to? No, no. They were still called to inherit the promised land. They were still called from that covenant that was given to Abraham to be blessed and to be a blessing to all nations, right? And they were still called to that land that he stood in, in Canaan, the cursed land, to come in and make it a good land for the glory of God so that his descendants would be as numerous as the sands on the seashore, right? Just physical descendants? No, spiritual descendants who would do as Abraham did. Amen. And so God didn't change his plan for them. In fact, what he did is he allowed to die what kept them from inheriting Amen. what he called them to, right? Amen. That entire generation who doubted what God could do, he let that die. And then he, kept, he carried them right back to what he had called them to. That's how God works. When he calls you to something, he'll take as long as it takes. It doesn't matter if you have to go around the desert for 40 years. It doesn't matter. He will teach you what you need to know and who you need to be before you inherit that promised land. I would rather be in the desert with God than in the promised land without him. Amen. What I love is when I look at how God is towards his people, we think in terms of timelines. We think in terms of natural and physical resources. 
That's what we look at. We say, God, you better do something quick. My resources are running out. My time is running out. My friends are running out, right? You remember stories about Saul and his army dwindling, takes it into his own hands so that he can get what he thought God was calling him to. It's not about that. It's not about you going into the promised land. It's not about you winning the battle. It's about you and God being on the same page, right? And that's you getting in line with what he's doing. Now, what I love too is that he has placed inside of us these gifts, these callings, these anointings. And the world puts these things on top of us, right? The world puts the lies. The world puts the deceit. The world says, this is who you are. You can't do this. You came from a this, or you'll always be a this. The world does that. The world lays these things on top of you to hinder you from realizing who God created you to be. When you come to the Lord, right? The old has gone. The new has come. He put these things inside you so that they could flourish for his glory. And they were inside you. His gifts and his callings are irrevocable, right? So when we look at how God works through us, he puts these things inside us, waiting for them to come to life. And he will clear everything out of the way that needs to be cleared out of the way so that when it's time, you succeed because he is able to make you stand. When he calls you to something, he will finish the good work that he starts in you. Amen? There's a story of Israel once they came into that promised land. Because how many know even once you receive what God has called you to, it doesn't mean that it's smooth sailing from then on out, right? Right? Right. So there's a story of Israel. Once they got into that land, there is a guy named Ezra. And Ezra comes onto the scene after Israel has been taken into captivity by Babylon. So this was a a king, Nebuchadnezzar, and it was prophesied all these things. Israel would be broken down, and they didn't repent. They didn't turn back to God. They were serving other gods. They were doing what they wanted to do, not paying attention to God anymore. They were in the promised land. They had what they needed. Thank you, God. You did it. All right, we're going back to what we want to do now. And so God found them there, right? And he allowed them to be taken into captivity. He allowed their city to be destroyed. Because why? It's not about that. It's not about that and you being in a physical place and you having certain things and things looking a certain way for you. He doesn't care about that. We care about that. He knows what we care about, but he would rather be in an intimate, sold out relationship of love with you than for your situation to look a certain way. So he will mess things up so that you turn back to him because that's what's most important. So in true and keeping and keeping true to his character, he allowed Israel to be taken captive into Babylon. And when they resisted and said, no, it can't be this way, can't be this way. God will rescue us back from this. It couldn't be this bad. Things can't be this bad. He'll, he'll take us back there. The word came from the Lord. You better settle down in this because you're going to be here for a while. Plant some gardens, figure out how to live and go back to depending on me. And once things are in the right place, then I'll begin to rebuild you. And then we'll talk about the promised land again. So time went by and Israel began to get the picture with their city in ruins that they had been called to. Their city in ruins, in captivity. Finally, they were released. A small number of people went back to help start rebuilding the city. And if there's a, if there's a temple where God's presence dwells in the city and there's walls, which is basically a symbol of the protection of the people, which do you think that God would care about rebuilding first? A temple. Why? Because that's where his presence is. And where we might look at it and say, oh, it's important to have the protection first in case your enemies come. Set up the walls, God. That's what you want to do first. God says, it's most important for you to be right with me. We'll worry about the walls later. We'll worry about all your defenses, all your protections. We'll worry about your image and the way that people see you. We'll worry about all that later. Right now, you are broken. Don't pretend to be anything else. You are broken. The temple must be rebuilt. The heart must be rebuilt when we come to God. When we find ourselves in captivity, needing to be restored with a loving God, the heart must be faced first. God will deal with that before he brings you back to the promised land, before he gives you everything that he's called you to, because he wants you to be able to handle it once you get there. So the temple was rebuilt. Here's what I love. A guy named Cyrus was prophesied about that he would pay for the whole thing. And he did. Paid for the rebuilding of the temple. 
issued the decrees, took care of all the politics, and the temple was rebuilt. So then Esther comes along, and the enemy tries to destroy the people of God, as he does with us, right? In the middle of what we're called to, he tries to thwart the whole thing. Come in, bring up division, bring accusations, remind you of who you are, right? Tell you what's possible, what's not possible, and tries to destroy what God is calling you to. But God raises up people, whether it's you in a situation or someone close to you, someone that will encourage you, someone that will bring a timely word, right? Just like Elijah being fed by ravens by the stream. He will bring you what you need. And God raised up a deliverer in Esther. And when Haman, an evil guy, tried to kill the people of Israel, Esther stepped in and fought on behalf of the people, risked her life to approach the king, and the king granted her request and issued another decree that allowed the people to defend themselves and they were saved. So Esther sat on the throne as queen. The temple was rebuilt. The rest of the city was in ruins. Esther sat on, on the throne as queen and the people were still living in this pseudo-captivity, pseudo-slavery in Babylon, not fully realizing what God had called them to by living there and prospering and thriving, but still living in the, in, in, in the way that things used to be, still living in the world, if you will, right? But Esther sat on the throne as queen and she continued to battle on behalf of her people. There's a guy named Nehemiah came to the king one day and said, I'm sad. The king said, why are you sad? Because my city, my people are in ruins and they're not thriving and I want to help them. I want to go back and rebuild the walls. So the king said, okay. And the Bible says it with his queen sitting right there beside him. God continued to use her as a deliverer in the people's lives and the entire project was paid for. Two and a half miles long worth of walls, 50,000 people, eight feet wide, 40 feet high in 52 days. God did that. Because resources are something that we are limited to. God does not have limited resources. God is not incapable of organizing a project to make your life be beautiful again. And when he does it, then it's beautiful. When you do it, it's a disaster and you end up going around the desert. You end up staying in pseudo captivity. You end up staying back in the way that things used to be, never fully realizing the potential that God has called you to. So the same thing that he's been doing for years, the same thing that he did with his people Israel as they were coming to the promised land, and then as they needed to be brought back into captivity so that they could learn to depend on him again, same thing that he's been doing for thousands of years, he still does today with us. You know, when you work out, which I haven't done in a while, don't, say, don't laugh, that's, that's not why I'm saying that. But when you work out, how many know that when you, when you lift, what happens to your muscles when you lift more than, they tear, right? But what happens after they tear? They heal, and they get what? Stronger. Seems to be a natural principle that God has put into effect in his creation, that things before they can get stronger and better have to get torn down, have to get broken, so that he can be the one that builds it. Amen? And when God builds it, his laborers don't labor in vain. Look at Psalm 51. You know, the idea of something being broken is a negative thing. If your car breaks, right? If this chair were to break, if the AC broke, whew, up here, man, that would be a bad deal. Chicago, not such a big deal. Down here, big deal. When things break, it's a bad thing. And what's crazy is that even though we're talking about this concept of God allowing us to be broken, 
right? Even though we're talking about it, even though we talk about, yeah, but this is how God works. And if he breaks you, it's only to rebuild you again, stronger than you were before. Even in talking about it, it still won't alleviate the pain that comes from being broken. That's the crazy part about it, is if we talk about being tested, right? We will always be tested till the day we die. We will continue to be tested, right? And if we're tested, if God brings us to a place of testing, he will see what's in our hearts and then he will act accordingly, all for his glory. But even, even though we understand that process, in the middle of the testing, it's still difficult, isn't it? Even though I know when I'm working out and my muscles are breaking down, it doesn't, just the knowledge that it's difficult and that it hurts doesn't alleviate the pain. So think about it, when you're going through a testing, even if I said, look, even though you're out of, right, there's too much month and not enough money, right? <laughs> even, though, even though it looks like there's no resources, and I tell you, I promise you, God will be faithful. Trust in Him. And you know He's been faithful before. There's still a part of you that goes, yeah, but it might not work out. Yeah, but He might not be faithful anymore. Am I wrong? No, Am I the only one that feels like that? No. I've seen God be faithful over and over and over again, and yet in this moment, I don't know if he can do this. I've, I know he did that, I get that, but that was easier than this. This is a lot more difficult. And so we begin to doubt God, and we begin to doubt that this natural process of breaking down, we begin to doubt that it will actually work in our lives in this moment. And here's the crazy part is that even in our doubt, even in our worrying that he won't come through, he still uses that. That's perseverance. Even if we get to this place where we say, man, I know, God, I, I know, but I just don't think you can do that. You know what? You can't do it. I know that you can't do it. Like, for instance, picture Abraham, right? He was told he was going to have a child, and he's running out of time. Time goes by. More time. More time. You know what? Tell you, tell you what, God, I'm going to help you out a little bit. We do have this other woman in the house. I'll bet you, I'll bet you we have a good chance of having a son right there. And so Ishmael was born, right? And even when God came back to him later about the promise that he had given him, he's like, oh, that Ishmael would be blessed. He still didn't believe that God could do what he said he would do. Why? Because his resources were running out. Because he doubted that this process of Breaking down, right? And in that moment, he was breaking down Abraham's doubt. In this process of breaking down, that it will actually work out the way that God said it would because all of the evidence points to it not working out. But even in that, God ended up using that situation to teach a lesson about his character. He won't waste those situations. Psalm 51, 16, you guys are there? says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Man, I can tell you guys this. There's been seasons of weeping for us as we have moved forward in what God has called us to. And it has gotten difficult, very, very difficult. So much so that I, too, was at that place where I began to doubt that God could fulfill what he was calling us to. And I can't stand here and promise you that I won't get to that place again. I can't stand here and promise you that I won't get to the place where I want to quit again. But what I can say is that even when I am faithless, he remains faithful. Amen. And what he has called you to, he will surely see it to completion in your life. So what I'm saying now is that if your heart is broken praise god because he doesn't despise that in fact he cherishes that and desires that more than burnt offerings and sacrifices if your heart is broken if it looks impossible and you are at the end of what you can do in your own strength and you have run out of all your own resources and it looks impossible and that's how you feel praise god because that's where he comes through. And when you reach that point, 
Who gets the glory when it works out the way he said it would? He does. He does. Not you, not me. Because think about this. If, we, if, he, if he let us keep those resources, if he let it work out all according to plan, no problems, what might we tend to do like we do when things work out? Hey, it's just the way I just, just I'm just bred that way. That's, it all worked out. I mean, yes, <laughs> glory to God. But I mean, look, I mean, these hands, come on. That's what we tend to do, right? When it works out, it's like, you're welcome. You're welcome. But when everything else has fallen apart and there's no chance that it was us, then it's God. Why did he choose Israel? Because they were this huge nation that was capable of defeating all their enemies because of their superior size? No. Oh. Because in the end, when they succeeded and when they prospered, it would only be because of him. Nobody could argue that. Isaiah 58. Hmm. The Lord will guide you. This is verse 11. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. God says about prophecy that I make known the end from the beginning so that when it happens, you will see that I am God. And we see as he tells us, I will do what I said I would do in your life. We see that. And we recognize that opportunity in that moment. I can believe what he said and walk in victory until that day. Or I can doubt it all along the way, go around the desert several times, and then finally get there and say, I guess you were right all along, God. You proved me wrong. There's a different way that we can live. We can say, here's what God has told me. Here's what his promises are. I will walk in victory until I see that come to pass. Or we can say, you got your work cut out for you, God. I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can do that. Sure doesn't look like it now. Well, this just broke. This is gone. Now how are you going to do it? Right? Two different ways to live. One yields peace. One yields a life of blessing, a life of joy. Right? Also with seasons. Yes, seasons come and seasons go. Different seasons in that. But the overall theme of your life will be one of trust in the Lord amen, and, amen. and fearlessness. Yeah. Why? Because trusting in the Lord produces love amen. in us. And when we love, right, what does perfect love do? Cast out, Cast out all fear. Amen. Why? Because fear has to do with punishment. And when you recognize God's love for you and what that actually means... You just begin to scratch the surface of it and you begin to understand, here's what kind of love I receive from this family member. Or here's what kind of love I receive from these people at school or these people at work or from my this or from my that. Here's that kind of love. But I'm going to trust that this God that I'm reading about, that I'm hearing about, loves me in a way that is far superior to any kind of love I could receive here on this earth. I'm going to trust that that love that he's talking about is real and that it can be mine and that it is mine in Jesus. And in that, fear begins to be driven away. Fear about what will happen to your future. Fear about what will happen to your family, to your job, to your money, to yourself, to your health, to all your stuff. All this fear starts to go away. Does it mean that nothing negative will happen? No. It means you won't be afraid from glory to glory as God delivers you. A different way to live. One, full of fear. Walking in fear. Living in depression. And everything that comes with that. The other one, living in love. And being a light that shines brightly and ministers to everyone around you. Whew, look at Revelation 12. Mm, mm, mm. So 
So these series of broken places in your life that you've been through up until now, that you will most assuredly go through again. This series of broken places. What's so great about the God that we serve is that it's not just about this tiny little experiment where you're getting broken and getting rebuilt and getting broken and getting rebuilt and getting broken and getting rebuilt. But the, the broken places in your life make up what's called your testimony. They make up what's called your testimony. And the reason that you can be saved is because of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And so because we are saved and we can look back over those broken places and we see our testimony, we have power in that. In fact, so much power that we don't even need anything else to overcome. Like Revelation 12, verse 11. Let's read it together. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. How will we overcome? By the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. If you don't know about the Bible and you're wondering how you can talk to people until that day when you learn about the Bible, you tell them what Jesus has done for you. We were singing because of what you've done for us. The world sees and soon forgets, but we won't forget who you are and what you've done for us. You want to start getting filled with joy? You want to see change happen around you? You want to see people's lives begin to be affected? Even though you may not feel eloquent, even though you may not have a bunch of scripture verses memorized, you tell them about what Jesus has done for you. Why? Because the man with the experience is not at the mercy of the man who merely has an argument. Amen. When you're standing up against someone who seems intellectually superior to you and seems that they can cut you down, you know what they can't take away from you? What Jesus has done in your life. Amen. Because you were this way. And but for the grace of God, you would remain in that situation. But at some point, you came to know this loving God who reached down and said, while you're still a sinner, I will die for you so that you can be free. And that freedom that you have is not just for yourself, is not just for yourself. The freedom that you have been given because of the blood of Jesus is for the benefit of others. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. He received the blessing. And, and, and here's, here's what's even better, is that when you share it, when you get it out there, it's even more of a blessing to you. Amen. As a pastor who sees fruit of fruit, you know that's true. Amen. When we hold in what God has done for us, it's not just us who suffers. It's everyone around us. When you tell about what God has done, I don't care how uncomfortable it may be. I don't care how inappropriate it may seem in a different situation. When you talk about the glory and the goodness of God, he will work all things together for your good. Don't you worry about the consequences that come from uncomfortable situations where you're sharing what Jesus has done for you. He'll work that out. We should not be afraid of man who can only harm the body. Man, it's not, it's not just the truth that sets you free. It's the truth that you know that sets you free. I can have a winning lottery ticket in my pocket. I don't know the numbers. I'm a millionaire and I never even knew it, right? It's true that I'm a millionaire because I have the winning lottery ticket, but I don't know it. It's not just the truth that sets you free. It's the truth that you know. And if you know the truth, then you are set free. Amen. Isaiah 61. Jesus began his ministry by talking about who he was and what God had called him to do. The foundation of everything that you will do for the glory of God, for his kingdom, is based off of your understanding what he has called you to. If you don't understand what God has called you to, put yourself in positions to find that out. Surround yourself with people who hear from him. Pray that he would reveal it to you. 
And you do it until you find that out. You serve him until you find that out. Because if you think that you will find out what God has called you to, like this, right? That's just not how it works. As we begin to serve, as we begin to walk forward in faith, as we begin to take steps, he reveals to us more about his will and his plan for our lives. And as we surround ourselves with brothers and sisters and lock arms with them, even when we want to isolate because things got really hard and we don't want to see people anymore, right? When I don't want to be somewhere because it's really, really difficult and I don't want them to ask me about what happened here and all these kinds of things and it's really, really hard, even in those times, because it's easier to be by yourself, even in those times, we surround ourselves with brothers and sisters. Why? Because they help us see what God has called us to. And if that's the foundation of everything that we will do for him, why would we despise that? Why would we do that? When you want to stay home, force your, beat your body and make it your slave. You want to know what Paul was talking about? That's what he was talking about. When your flesh is trying to tell you, don't do that, don't do that, and it's holding you back from what God is calling you to do, beat your body and make it your slave. Step out into what God has called you to, and I promise you will see blessings from that. Because most of the world stops there. Isaiah 61 the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, verse 1, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. What is hope? What is hope? Hope is I was there and I was rescued out of it. It didn't kill me. That's hope. I have family members who lost a daughter to cancer. She was five years old. And in that moment, they battled with different kinds of thoughts, negative thoughts towards God. And it took time, and it took healing, and it took prayer. But God turned things around, and now they minister to people whose kids are in the hospital who are dying of cancer. And you tell me who's going to have more power and ability to speak into someone's life, right? Someone who walks in that has no idea what these people are going through and tries to talk to them about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. Or someone who says, I've been there. I've been right where you are. And I know it doesn't make any sense, but God is faithful. When they can look into your eyes and you can tell them I've been there I've been right where you're at and God can deliver you because he did it for me I was where you are and he delivered me that's the power of your testimony man if you need to read this to yourself in the mirror for a few weeks every day he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. A world full of prisoners, and he has called us to proclaim freedom. Freedom that is beyond and above and deeper than physical freedom, spiritual freedom. If you can understand how powerful physical freedom is, spiritual freedom is infinitely deeper. Why? Because the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And eternal freedom is the most beautiful thing that you could ever know. <sighs> to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. When Abraham came back after he took Sarah, his half-sister, and came back to where God had called him to. Because Abraham went in a circle too. He stopped, found himself at an altar, making a sacrifice to God to hear from him. Went off to Egypt. Because he stopped in the cursed land, and he's like, and then walked to Egypt, right? 
because there was provision, there was predictability, stability in Egypt. But God brought him right back around and ended up back at the same altar. And it says that he brought him to a place and the meaning of that place was the granary. There were trees of strength, great oaks of strength, oaks of righteousness right next to the granary. The great trees of Mamre at Hebron. The meaning of those words, he was planted near oaks of righteousness. When you decide to step forward in what God has called you to, and you move forward in everything that he has for you, he will place around you people that will hold your arms up as you fight, as you battle. And he will make sure that you finish what he has started in you. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. I think back to Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And if you take away anything from this message, do not despise the places where you find yourself broken. If you wind up on your knees, unable to do anything, but just cry out to God, and it's one of those deep, weeping places that comes from your gut because there is no way that you can see that this situation could work itself out. Then praise God because in that moment, when he works it out, it will be to his credit as your loving father who was faithful again. Whether or not you believed that he could do it, he did it again. And he will do it again and again and again and again until the day that we are all standing face to face with him in glory. Our God is a faithful God and he will do what he said he would do and he will finish what he started. Let's pray.